Lakers got blown out, trounced, destroyed. I totally, totally get it. But I just got an aside. I just got a side story. Did you see Damian Lillard put on a epic show for the ages? Steph Curry, I don't know. Steph Curry, I don't know. I just don't know right now, Steph Curry. I just don't know right now. I, we got to discuss. We got to discuss the shoot. The, 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 I'm stuttering. Damn it. That's what Dame Lillard got me doing this morning. First takes in the house. Let's go. Tough to close a team out. Brooklyn trying to put the Celtics away. <coughs> I had to level up. I was too patient. Oh. Back to the hood. We going back to the base. And Kyrie Irving went full Uncle Drew right there. Hey, right now. Cut back at this thing. Here we go. Flooding my reach. If you play, you get kind of lit. Tatum is cash money. Durant, Irving, Harden. 15,000 plus on their feet as the Brooklyn Nets will advance to round two. Another one. Another one. I like that beat, and I got some heat for you. Breaking news on first take on a Wednesday. This morning, our Adrian Wojnarowski reporting Boston Celtics president of basketball operations, Danny Ainge, seriously considering his future with the franchise and could make a decision to step down. Good day. Welcome to first take. Hello, Max and I in studio, Stephen A. Uh, talk to me. Undisclosed location. Yeah. What's your reaction to this news? Well, I think that we, we have to recognize the fact that Danny Ainge is one of the best executives in the sport. He's done a pretty damn good job uh, at the helm for the Boston Celtics. They have a championship. Uh, they've had a big three. They've been a perennial playoff contender. First with KG, Ray Allen, Paul Pierce, Rondo. Then after that with, with Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown. Uh, they went to three conference titles in a, a conference championship uh, series uh, in the last four years b- before this season. Let's give credit where credit is due. When he hired Brad Stevens out of Buffalo, uh, or Butler, I'm sorry, uh, that was definitely something that nobody saw coming. And Brad Stevens, even though we've got our questions about him at this particular juncture, the bottom line is, is that overall he's done a good job. And you've got cornerstones of your franchise in Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, who are 24 and 22 years old, respectively. And so when you look at it from that perspective, we can't sit up here and acknowledge uh, or fail to acknowledge that Danny Ainge hasn't done a good job because he has done a good job. You're just looking for him to pull the trigger on that big deal and get it done and get them over the hump again. And that was something he was incredibly reluctant to do. So that is what it is. You respect him. You respect the job that he's done. But as long as they've got Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown there, it should be a job most executives uh, should clamor for. Let me make this real simple. Danny Ainge is an a very good GM. He's not just good, he's a very good GM. Put that camera on me and I'll finish this thought. But he's not good enough. That's the issue. He's not good enough. I understand this, Stephen A, as a Yankees fan. Brian Cashman is an excellent GM. I'm a Yankees fan. I expect to win the World Series more than any other team. If that doesn't happen, the GM's not good enough, period. Certainly not when your rivals are outperforming you over a period of time. That means you're not good enough. The Celtic standard, right? There's only one standard that's even better than the Celtic standard in the history of the NBA. That's the Lakers standard. Same number of championships, but the Lakers have done far more in the modern era. You know, shot clock, three-point, absorption of the ABA teams, however you want to define modern era, Lakers dominated. But the Celtics have also been excellent in the modern era, and they have that kind of standard. Like, if we're not the best, if we're not in it every year, if, if the argument can't be made that we're the number one franchise, our GM's not good enough. Danny Ainge has done, uh, you, you pointed out, I don't want to go all over it again, over it all again, but he's done an excellent job. They're a powerhouse most seasons. And how long have we been sitting here, Stephen A, going, ooh, they're that one tweak away from getting over the top. And as much as it's, you know, tr- Trader Danny and all that stuff, he never seems to be able to pull the trigger on that one move where going into the season you go, oh, the Celtics got this. Not that they're going to be competitive, but no, no. This is the team to beat. And he's had plenty of years to do it, and he's come close, and he's had plenty of resources, which he deserves credit for, but he hasn't gotten it done. Very good. Not good enough for the Celtics. 
Well, in this day and age, particularly with super teams being assembled and things of that nature, and no one clamoring to go uh, to Boston, Massachusetts, obviously it's going to be a very difficult task. And I'd like to remind everybody, as much credit as we want to give Danny Ainge, uh, a lot of credit should go to Doc Rivers because Doc Rivers was on a hot seat years ago in Boston because Danny Ainge hadn't given him any players. Paul Pierce at the time wanted out. Mm -hmm. This is back in like 2007, 2008. Paul Pierce wanted out, okay? But then Danny Ainge obviously got KG, um, and obviously they got Ray Allen as well. And so the combination of the two obviously made them a big three. And when you see players that wanted to come there thereafter, it had a lot to do with Doc Rivers. See, Jalen Brown was drafted, and uh, Jason Tatum is drafted. Danny Ainge going out there and acquiring some big-time free agent He's not the greatest recruiter in the world. He can build a franchise, mm. but he's not the greatest mm -hmm. recruiter. Mm. And in this day and age, I think you're going to require that, and that's why you need somebody else probably Ooh. other than him. It's a great point, especially yeah. in the Northeast. You're, you're not in a no-tax state. You're not in a sunshine mm -hmm. state. You're right. All right. Uh, again, Woj with the bomb yeah. this morning. Let's get to their ultimate rival. You know who that is, the Lakers. Last night, an absolute demolition in Phoenix, y'all. They got the brakes beat off them without Anthony Davis. Phoenix now leads the series 3-2. LeBron had 24-5-7. and seven. The King not sugarcoating anything. Just got our ass kicked. I mean, it's just that simple. Um, they did, got to whatever they wanted to get to in this game, and... Uh, you know, we got to be better, obviously, if we want to force a game seven. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's literally win or go home at that point. So, you know, you, you, uh, you shoot all the bullets you got and throw the gun, too. So, um, you know, I look forward to the, you know, to the environment. Obviously, our Lake of Faithful going to give us a lot of energy. Um, and I look forward to the moment. I look forward to the challenge and, uh, you know, see what brings out the best of me and my, my teammates. The Lakers, uh, one loss shy of becoming the sixth defending champion to lose in the first round under the NBA's current playoff format. It would be LeBron's first time going home in the first round. He entered the playoffs 14-0 in the opening round. Stephen A., you're up first. Who's most accountable for the Lakers' blowout loss? Well, I, I, I'm going to put most of the onus on LeBron James and Coach Frank Vogel. I mean, listen, it's a game six. It's not a game seven. Uh, it's not the end. You know, you don't write the epitaph of LeBron James because of this, because there is a game six, rather, because uh, this was game five. There is a game six, uh, potentially a game seven. So it's not over. Uh, but you knew what you was what was stacked against you, particularly with Dan Anthony Davis out. And here you are. You show up. And I know that you made passes and guys weren't shooting open shots. I get all of that. Other times they were missing. Uh, and I let Max get into all of that because there were a few people on the Los Angeles Lakers that were pathetic. They were soft. They were weak. They came across as a team uh, that conceded uh, the game uh, pretty much minutes into it. But LeBron's the leader. And guess what? He didn't look much better. So I'm going to put that on him because it's not just about you scoring your points or whatever. It's you galvanizing the troops and leading in the way that you're supposed to. He didn't do that last night. But the big onus... A bigger onus to me falls on Coach Frank Vogel. See, this is it's moments like this where you get reminded that Frank Vogel wasn't their first choice. He really wasn't their second choice. It's just that because of somewhat of a check and pass against Jason Kidd, he couldn't be the guy that was hired to be the head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers because I'm here to tell you as a point of fact that Jeannie Buss wanted Jason Kidd to be the head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers, which is why everybody was contemplating, you know, how long is Frank Vogel going to be there? But props to Frank Vogel who came in and won the chip last year and had them ready to play in the bubble. But last night, Mr. Vogel, Coach Vogel, where the hell was your defense? I mean, we saw guys running layup lines. We saw guys shooting uncontested, wide-open three-point shots. We saw them pushing the ball up the floor and guys not getting back. We saw you start put forth a starting five last night that hadn't started together all season long, if I remember correctly. And by the way, where the hell is Montrell's Herald? Where the hell is he? Okay, because it's just inexcusable, inexcusable that you haven't found a way to use this dude who's the sixth man of the year. You brought him there. I understand that Andre Drummond is a bigger body. He can play. He was serviceable with his 13 rebounds for offensive. But Montrell's Herald is an energizer bunny. He's a dog, and I mean that in a positive way. He's a dog. Where the hell is he? You got to put him out there. 
You know Anthony Davis is not reliable. Now, I'm not going to disrespect Anthony Davis because if you injured, you injured. And he's got multiple injuries to the same leg, Max. And I get that. But damn, you got Charles Barkley on the air. I mean, if ever there was a time Charles Barkley was hilarious and made you fall out of your chair, it was street last clothes. night when he called Anthony Davis street clothes. Yeah, pull up the, the street 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 we have his street injury street history for this season, I, if we can pull that up. I, 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 I mean, that just, I mean, that was just hilarious, okay? And I ain't knocking, I don't like to chide in Anthony Davis, because you injured, you injured, and I respect that. But the bottom line is, he's an injury-prone player. You know this, Frank Vogel. How in the hell do you not prepare the Los Angeles Lakers, particularly your front line, to be able to play without Anthony Davis, at least defensively, at least when it comes to rebounding, at least when it comes to having some kind of interior presence. That's on Frank Vogel. That's on Frank Vogel. Yeah. So I'm just looking at it, Max, and I'll hand it off to you by saying this. LeBron James, listen, it's on the line. I don't want to hear no damn GOAT conversations. It was yeah. never an issue with me. I don't want to hear, you better show up in game six and be not just a great player we know you to be, somebody who's worthy of being on the Mount Rushmore, you better galvanize these troops and get these boys ready because your teammates look soft. They look weak. Last night, they just got straight pumped. You down All by right. 30 in the first let's half. Let's get, you let's get Max in here. That's what happened. The person most responsible for the loss, and it took a lot of people mm -hmm. to have a loss like that. Like, you could say whatever you want. I don't know what happened in the second half of that game. Anyone watching the second half of that game? Everyone was watching Denver and Portland. 20 down, 27 down, 30 points teams. at the half. Get out of here. The person most responsible for the loss is Dennis Schroeder. That's the person most responsible. And I don't want to hear, Stephen A., the particulars about what role needs to be filled now that AD's not playing. It's much simpler than that. Your best player is LeBron. He was able to play. Your second best player is AD. He couldn't go. Your third best player is Dennis Schroeder. Dennis Schroeder turned down... $84 million because he wants $100 million. He's the third best player on the team. He has to step up and be the second best player. The big question was, okay, Schroeder's better than Rondo in the regular season. We're not in the regular season now. We're in the playoffs, and there's playoff Rondo. What's playoff Schroeder look like? There's no such thing as playoff Schroeder, apparently. Stephen A., here are the numbers from Schroeder last night. 0 for 9 shooting, 0 for 4 from 3. He had one assist and no points. He had, when you needed this dude to step up, he had zero points. Not in the first quarter, second, in the game. Zero points. It, the first Laker to go scoreless in a playoff game while shooting nine-plus shots since the franchise moved to L.A. So you can talk to me about Montrez Harrell and Andre Drummond and how coach should have used them and LeBron not stepping up enough and everything else. Your wannabe $100 million point guard needed to step up, and he gave you zero points. He did something that no one has ever done with the Los Angeles Lakers. If you're looking for one guy to blame, Schroeder deserves it most. Please. Please, no disrespect, Max. You're not wrong. I'm not trying to imply that you're wrong with what you're saying about True to himself and his pathetic, weak, impotent performance. You're absolutely right. But it's an absolute joke if you acting like he the cause of what the hell happened last night. You could have a bad game like that from Truder and still be a bit more respectable. Understand that we're not here talking about how the Lakers lost a game. If we just talk about how they lost game five, we dissect how they lost game five, all right, you roll back to the Staples Center for game six. This conversation is about a beatdown that took place in Phoenix, a straight-up beatdown. They got punked, yo. I mean, these brothers rolled up on the court. Phoenix said, get the hell out of the state. And they did it in like inside of 15 minutes. We got Snoop Dogg on Instagram talking about the Clippers. 
The Clippers! So you had Snoop, Snoop Dogg. Talking, talking, talking Clippers. Clippers. You did something. I, put that. The, the, the Snoop Dogg wears purple and gold. Snoop Dogg got a car draped in purple and gold. Snoop Dogg got. I've been at the compound, Max. I've been at the compound. The Snoop compound. Lakers stuff everywhere. Snoop Dogg was the one going crazy when Kobe dropped 60 on his last night in the NBA. God rest his soul. Snoop Dogg was on Stephen A's world on ESPN+. Plus. The Clippers. The Clippers? And this brother goes on Instagram and it's like, yo, it's about the Clippers now because the Lakers are soft. He called the Lakers soft. He said they can't guard. He, he talked about Coach Frank Vogel and how he needed to be fired. He brought up Montrell's Herald. I mean, my God, that was a beat down. And they better show up against it. I got that. Molly, I got to fly to, I, I, I was planning on being in New York, looking forward to enjoying my next few weeks. The weather nice, it's beautiful, the weather, you know, you see outside the pier at South Street Seaport. I was planning on being in New York. I got to fly to L.A. tomorrow. I got to be there. Uh, we all feel very sorry for, for you. Because we feel very be sorry for you. It could Molly, be do you end. feel sorry for Stephen A? It could be the I end. always feel sorry yeah. for him. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying. Our sympathy, It could Stephen be the end. It yeah. could be the end. LeBron James, first time going home. In the first round. All right, let me just career. say this. Let me say this. LeBron James, keep in mind, has the most points per game when facing elimination. More than MJ, more than Will. So it ain't game. over, folks. <laughs> um, let's keep it going, though. All I have to say is 55. Dame time all night long. One of the most incredible postseason performances ever. Lillard, 55 points, an NBA playoff record, 12 three-pointers, and the Trail Blazers double overtime loss at Denver in Game 5 on Tuesday. Lillard broke the record of 11 set by Klay Thompson. That was in 2016, Game 6 against OKC. Dame Dalla. Tough loss, man. We, I mean, it's do or die now, so we got to win both of the next two games if we want to, if we want our season to continue. As simple as that. But after what you gave, just personally. Like, it don't matter. We lost the game. So, I mean, at this point, all that matters is we can't lose another game in this series. So, we go out there, we play to win the game, and uh, we came up short. So, uh, we're going back home. It's a, a must win, or else our season is over. And then we got to come back here and, and win on their floor again. So, I mean, that's what it is. How do you not root for that guy? Uh, Dame caused quite a stir on social media last night. Patrick Mahomes, uh, man, Dame Lillard is crazy. Steph Curry chimed in. Dame Lillard, that's all I have to say. Donovan Mitchell, wow. Stephen A., where does Lillard's performance rank? I have no idea. All I can tell you is that it's up there. It's one of the greatest performances I've ever seen in all my life. What a spec. Listen, I've seen Jordan drop 63 at the garden. I've seen Kobe drop 81. I've seen Devin Booker drop 70. And it's appropriate to bring Devin Booker's name up when he just dropped 30 on the Lakers last night. Okay. I've seen LeBron and Kobe drop 60. I've seen great performances from Dwayne Wade, Wade. But this brother, Damian Lillard. Oh my God. See, I just get sad. I'm sad over three things. I'm sad at his supporting cast. I'm sad at his coach. And I'm sad at the market he's playing in. I'd give anything for Damian Lillard to be in a market like New York City. I mean, my God. This brother, when it comes to clutch time, I mean, and, and then here's the thing. Let me, let me just break this down. I'm sad because I watched the brother drop four three, uh, 12 threes. I saw him drop a three at the end of regulation, two threes in the first overtime. I mean, this brother just brings you back, just keeps coming. He's just a sniper extraordinaire, the likes of which we haven't seen this side of Steph Curry, okay? And when you talk about clutch, you bring up Michael Jordan and the rest of the crew because he's right there when it comes to clutch, okay? And then you see this brother take the ball out of his hands and feed Robert Covington for a dunk. Covington, a veteran, not a rookie. He misses it. On another play, he gives the ball to C.J. McCollum. Now, I love C.J. I don't like the fact that he shot 31% last night. 
good brother, great shooter, you beautiful backcourt mate, even though I'm on the record stating those two will never win together because the combination of the two, they're both relatively small guards, and I think you need one bigger than smaller, and I think that you use one as a tradable asset to get what you need to put with the other. That's my personal opinion, Max. But you see Jay McCollum, and you a veteran who plays on this basketball court all the time, and you step out of bounds with the game on the line. Yeah, we you have let that your play. Right Can we pull that up, guys? Out the last 12 come seconds on, double man. overtime, what Stephen come is talking on. about. Yeah, come on. Come on. You you know, you, you just can't make a mistake like that. I understand no one's flawless. All of us are imperfect, okay? You cannot make that McCollum's, mistake. It's McCollum's usually reliable when you pressure. got... That's right. He is. He is. I'm not trying to throw any shade on him. I'm just talking no, about the you're one not play. Wrong what you're saying. You cannot make but, that mistake. But Look, Max, could you, you argue can't that, do that you wouldn't have seen somebody like an MJ or Kobe do that there and, and give him the ball? Like no, the no, game no, has no, no. taken the shot there. No, 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 no. MJ gave it up. MJ gave it up to Paxton. They, they would do it too, Molly. I, yes, I can't Molly. criticize MJ Damian Lillard up. for the mistakes of for Covington missing a dunk or from McCollum, who's normally clutch, stepping out of bounds. That's not Lillard's fault. It's an all-time great performance. To answer the question, it's as good a clutch performance as you want to see. But I want to be very clear about this. The best player in the game was the Joker. Get over it, America. The Joker was the MVP this year, and no one wanted that to be the case. Everyone, we all wanted it to be Damian Lillard, but it was Jokic. In the game last night, the reason Lillard had our jaws on the floor. It was jaw-dropping the way he kept it. They were dead, and he would shoot them back into it. Late in regulation, and then he hits three after three, and then the three to tie the game to send it to overtime. But you know why? Because the Joker was controlling the game. Then overtime starts. The Joker controls the game. He's the point center. He's finding open guys. Of course, he's not shooting it like Lillard. He did wind up with 38, 11, 9, and four blocks. But no, he cannot shoot like Lillard. No, he can't shoot in the clutch like Lillard. But the reason Lillard's clutch heroics were needed was because the Joker was controlling overtime. And then Lillard does it again and gets them to double OT. The Joker was the best there, too. He controlled it there, too. He was, he's the MVP of the league. He was the best player in the game last night. And, of course, he will be overshadowed by the heroics of Damian Lillard. Those heroics, which were all-time great. No argument there. Mm -hmm. Remember when I was mm -hmm. telling you, Stephen A., earlier, I well, know we can debate it later, that Steph Curry, except for when it counts most, and Lillard does a fair enough impersonation of Steph normally, that since he's better under pressure, give me Damian Lillard. I'm not taking anything away from Lillard, but the best player in the game last right. night was the Joker, and that's why his team won. Well, first of all, well, first of all, um, I would appreciate it if you wouldn't make it so obvious that you didn't watch the entire game because I know it's the second game is past your bedtime, Max. I know the second game is past your bedtime because evidently you didn't watch the game. As great as, Joker, as Jokic was, I'm sorry, I saw Michael Porter drop 26. I saw Monte Morris drop 28, and he was phenomenal in the second half. I understand that it ain't just about scoring. It's about passing, too. And you had Jokic feeding them. I get all of that. But these brothers were making shots. And when you look at the best player on the court last night, Jokic was absolutely phenomenal. I get it. Nurkic should be ashamed of himself because you see somebody like him. You got to put you got to put Enos Cantor on 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 um, on uh, Jokic because you know Nurkic wouldn't be able to do anything with them. Oh, because Nurkic fouled out at it from. I understand that, but I'm saying I'm just. What did I say about Nurkic the other day? Is my point. I understand he fouled out. The point that I'm trying to make, he can't deal with the brother. He can't. You know what? You got an offense. Make him work. Cause him some problems. But Nurkic can't do that yeah. when it comes against the Jokic. In the end, Damian Lillard was the best player on the court last night. The difference is Jokic had help, and Damian Lillard did it because there was a whole bunch of dudes shooting in the 30 percentile last night for Portland. They made mistakes too. They didn't show up to help Dame. All right. I got to wrap you up here, Stephen A., because I got some more breaking news here. This again from Woj on the Danny Ainge situation. Oh, Here's the latest. Let me read it to you on Twitter here. He's expected to step down as president of basketball operations for the Boston Celtics. Brad Stevens is expected to assume a more prominent role, a front office role with the team. Stevens moving into the front office on a full-time role and expected to start a search for a new head coach. Sources telling ESPN Celtics staff and coaches have been informed 
of those changes. Wow. We got all that? We'll react to it in a minute. Let me get in a break. Stay here. Plenty more to come here. I just gave you. I want to give you guys a chance to react to it. So, again, Danny Ainge expected to step down as president of basketball ops for the Celtics. Brad Stevens moves into the front office full time. And the Celtics are expected to start a search for a new head coach. Staff and coaches have been informed of these changes. Stephen A., talk to me. <clears throat> I'm torn. Um, I like Brad Stevens. I think Brad Stevens is a good coach. Um, he came into this season. He's been to the conference finals now three times in the last five years. I understand that. But Molly and Max Kellerman and the producers put us on a split screen, please, because I want to look at Molly and Max when I ask this question. If I remember correctly, did we not on several occasions have conversations this year? about whether or not Brad Stevens was going to last yeah. as head coach of the Boston Celtics mm -hmm. because of what a roller coaster ride this season has been and how it seemed like the young talent that you had available to you didn't seem on the same page. And as a result, it might be time for a new voice. Yep. I recall that being the case. Yeah. So we go through all of that. You get bounced out in the first round, albeit to the Brooklyn Nets, who most people believe are the favorites, and obviously you didn't have Jalen Brown, and that's to be acknowledged. You had what can only be described as a suspect relationship with the Marcus Smarts of the world, according to reports and things of that nature. And you're moving upstairs to the front office. You see, it's moments like this where I get on people's nerve, particularly white America and the NBA community specifically, because I point out it's beautiful to be a white guy. It's just beautiful. You know, you're a question mark as a coach in some people's eyes, including in Port in, in Boston, but somehow somewhere you moving upstairs and the paucity of opportunities for African Americans Continue to dwindle and dwindle and dwindle. We talked about the coach. We didn't even get into black folks in executive positions. We got one black man with power. I'm talking about he's the final say on basketball. I'm not talking about black folks sprinkled here and there in the front office where you're in the room and you play a role in the decision making. And I'm talking about one dude. And his name is Masai Ujiri in Toronto. Who's, we don't even have in the NBA a black dude in the United States that's making the final call on basketball-related matters. And somehow, some way, Brad Stevens, who I like, who I believe deserves to be a head coach on this level, a shaky season. And he's going upstairs. That's my reaction to this, Max. I actually don't give a damn about anything else pertaining to the Boston Celtics right now. That's where my mind is. Well, I, I understand it's, it's it. It's just a I'm, beautiful, I'm, beautiful thing sometimes. It I'm really not is. saying that what you're bringing up doesn't have something to it. I don't know if it applies here or not. Um, I don't know if it applies here or not. Masai Ujiri is interesting because when you point that out, the one if what black apply, man. I don't understand, Max. If well, what I'll, I'll, I'll explain. If what applies Masai, here. Masai Ujiri, okay. that, that this is, there's a racial component to it that is um, explicitly or unfair, right? I was, Masai Ujiri is an interesting case because I think it's a powerful one. He is the one black man who has the final say, you're saying, in basketball operations. He is not African-American. He's African, and he doesn't actually work in the United States. He works in Canada. It's in, that's interesting. Maybe that's just a big coincidence, but that is interesting, and I think it's a, a powerful example that points out what you mean. I think about someone like Doc Rivers. Doc Rivers, who's won a championship. He did it in a league where he had a big three. No one else did, and he won one championship. And I, I think Doc is a great coach. Let me just say that. He's a great coach. I think most people agree. And he gets the Clippers job where he's GM and coach. And that's not working out because he was a bad GM, but still a great coach. They take GMing away, but they keep him as coach. And eventually it seems like the Clippers and Doc kind of lost interest in each other. 
And he immediately gets a plum job. Like, who wouldn't want that Sixers job? That's a real good job. And gets a job as a Sixers coach. And here we are again saying, boy, Doc better not blow another 3-1 lead because he's getting known for that. But we know he's a great coach. Whatever the, the circumstances kind of make him look bad here, but we know that Doc is a great coach. Brad Stevens is known as an excellent basketball mind. Now, what you're referring to uh, in terms of his not using pieces properly, and I don't know about that. I don't know. Or maybe losing some of the locker room. You mentioned how if people, the players can drown out the same voice after a while. He's been there for a minute. Maybe it's a personality issue with certain players that can happen as a coach, but they still value his basketball acumen. And he was groomed by Danny Ainge, who was a successful GM. And so they can have some continuity with him in the front office. I hear what you're saying. And at times, you and I are lockstep with that message. Wait, this is wrong. I didn't agree with you about Steve Nash because I thought that was a relationship thing with KD or Kyrie. And had Steve Nash been an African-American, former great point guard and everything with that relationship, I think it's possible he could have gotten that job. But that's unknowable because he's not. So I didn't agree with you there, and I don't know that I agree with you here. I think it's an interesting okay. question you're raising. Right. Yeah, but let me given get, what I just me, said, I don't know I agree with let you. Let me get in here quickly, Stephen A. The, the team that you're alluding to, don't get frustrated, Stephen A. I have information. I got information for you. Relax. You're going to have time to respond. The term is called failing up, by the way. Molly, so, please don't do, don't do that. Don't do that. Please don't. Do, do you go want ahead, the, information the information or no? Go ahead. Okay. Yes, so, I do. Yes, okay. I do. So this is according to Woe, just putting it out there, that Stevens has been described as worn down since being in the bubble and that he welcomed the chance to make the transition and that he's going to lead the search to find the new head coach. That's what I wanted to get in there. First of all, I was wrong about saying uh, 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 Masai Ujiri is the only one. Raphael Stone in Houston obviously is the new GM. That was recent. Uh, yeah. For the Houston Rockets, he did. He, he, that was recent. He makes final say. So I just wanted to make sure I corrected myself. It's those two. That's number one. Number two, this is why I'm anxious to, uh, I'm, I was anxious to get back in here, Molly and Max. Because Max, to me, and, and, and no shade thrown at you whatsoever, you're making the mistake of interpreting my comments the way certain folks who are friends of mine who happen to be white have made the same mistake. When you say the racial component there with the Boston Celtics. I'm not accusing the racial component as it pertains specifically with the Boston Celtics. No more than I was accusing the Brooklyn Nets of that. No more than I was accusing Urban Meyer of that in Jacksonville. I'm fully aware that it's the relationship. It's not because somebody was white. I get that. They have relationships with these people. Sean Marks had a relationship with Steve Nash. Urban Meyer obviously has a relationship with Tim Tebow, the Boston Celtics clearly have a relationship with Brad Stevens. I'm just saying that the opportunities that were accorded to those people don't happen for black people. Well, that's why you I brought up Doc Rivers. I started with Doc Rivers. I, no, no, I'm just, I'm just talking about from a generic. I'm not talking about the individual organizations hiring somebody because they're white. That's not what I'm saying. I understand it's relationships. I'm just saying those relationships don't exist for black people. You can't be a quarterback on the NFL, leave the game for years, come back, want to be a tight end, and get an opportunity on an NFL squad. You cannot, having never coached on any level, and inherit a championship caliber squad with KD and Kyrie and James Harden on the way. And you can't be Brad Stevens, and you're struggling, and there's questions about whether or not you're going to get fired. And then turn around and, and you have a disinterest in coaching and then turn around and get elevated to a front well, office spot. All I'm saying is. No, that I understand that's your point for us. I, Stephen, that's A, wait, I, mean I, I, I have that's no misapprehension. I, mean. I want to be very clear. I understand your point. Crystal clear. The reason I started with the Doc Rivers example is because the examples you're using, you can say, well, that might happen for a black uh, uh, coach. Or, or an African-American in this situation. But unless you actually see it happen, then you're right. Then you can't use You might say it might. Well, then why hasn't it, right? That's why I start with Doc Rivers. There are examples. For example, Doc Rivers. 
of coaches who we just know are excellent basketball guys and excellent at what they do. And for whatever reason, it's not working out in a certain situation, so they're moved into another situation. Like, Doc had the GM role taken away from him, but remained his coach. When he lost that job, he immediately got another great job because it's Doc Rivers, and everyone knows he's excellent. And maybe the Celtics feel that way about Brad Stevens. Now, what you say about relationships is true. One of the reasons for the Rooney rule is there's, a, about. there's a good old boy network, and, and if that's exclusively white, that's a problem. Some people might say, well, the good old boy network, whatever it looks like, is a problem. But certainly if it's exclusively white, it's a bigger problem. I understand the point. I'm just not sure I would apply it here to Brad Stevens. I don't know that. But I'm not trying to. I'm not, try, I'm not trying to apply anything specifically to Brad Stevens other than highlighting that those opportunities don't happen for us. I'm not saying it happened for him because he's white. No more than I was saying that about Tebow or Steve Nash. I'm saying those things highlight to black people. We sit back, didn't, Molly and Max, and we go like this. Didn't Man, Isaiah? That won't happen for us. When Isaiah was with the Knicks, us. when Isaiah was with the Knicks, he bounced between coach and GM, and he was not having a lot of success, but it was Isaiah Thomas, and he bounced between coach and GM. We're, like, struggling to find Here's one example, and we have a million Knicks examples. Job, not the Brooklyn Nets. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, but the, the Sixers Nets are. Job. That's true, but the Sixers are a great job, and Mac, Doc got that Mac, one, two, Mac, three. Max, you, yeah, yeah, but, but Doc Rivers has been a coach for 20-plus years. The mm -hmm. point is, is that with the Isaiah Thomas thing that you brought up, you said you could coach the Brooklyn Nets to a title. With the roster that they had. Got that. So, right, let's, 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 let, you guys, what the challenge is there? Let, let me bring in Kendrick Perkins, obviously. Uh, or, or we're going to get Kendrick Perkins after the break because we went a little long with that. All right, we'll get Perk after the break, get his thoughts. Obviously, he won a chip with the Boston Celtics. We'll take a quick. I have errands to run for me when you get here in New York because you lost one of those bets. I think you do. LeBron James and the Lakers are losing tonight. They are losing. And if they win tonight, I will let Kendrick Perkins off the hook. He will not have to. But what if but, they lose? But if they lose, but if I'm right, Kendrick Perkins, and they lose, oh, I'm going to double up, brother. I'm taking that bet because I believe that the greatest, one of the greatest in your eyes of all time, is yes. going to go out there and deliver in great fashion tonight. Does anybody have anything to say to each other? Carry on. Okay, then I'll go ahead. I'm going uh, to let Kendrick Perkins speak. I'm not, I'm not the one that has explaining to do. He does. Perk? What, what, you, what you mean? And Max, um, first of all, you told Max, us to carry, you, you told us to carry on. You told us to carry the hell on. Lakers are winning. Did that happen? No, it didn't. And you know what? Hey, look, I'm on to my bed, okay? But I got a question to ask, all right? I have a question to ask. What the hell are the role players doing? And I get it. LeBron James only took 19 shots. He probably should have took 25 or 30. But what the hell is Dennis Schroeder doing? What is Caldwell Pope doing? What is Andre Drummond doing? You know what? At the start of the game, the first player of the game, they ran a play. Frank Vogel drew up a hell of a play on the baseline, a misdirection play where it was a cross screen for Andre Drummond. He turned around and did like a little pin down for Caldwell Pope in the corner. He was wide open and he passed the stop. From that point there, I knew it was going to be hell in the cell. I wanted to text you right there, Stephen A., and tell you no bet. Because, look, at the end of the day, superstars are going to be superstars. And I get that, right? They're going to have their moments. They're going to have their 20-plus tonight. But role players, again, role players help you win games in the playoffs, which help you win series. And right now, the Lakers are not getting a damn thing from their role players. Dennis Schroeder finished with zero points last night. Zero, a goose egg. Him and Caldwell Pope. The Phoenix Suns, young cast, and Cameron Payne, Cam Johnson, uh, Britt, all are out playing this veteran group is disturbing to me. And I look at the game that was that actually happened to be the game of the night, which was the Nuggets and the Portland Trailblazers, and Dame Lillard and the historical the historic performance that he put on last night. And I said, you know what? 
you know what was the common denominator on why the Denver Nuggets won that damn game? It wasn't because of it was it wasn't because of Jokic having thirty uh, eight. It wasn't because of Michael Porter Jr. having twenty six. It was because of Mo- Morris, who outscored the entire Portland bench and had twenty eight points. Role players matter. Look, you could depend on your stars. You could talk about LeBron and Anthony Davis, but your role players have to step up. Listen, man. I would tell you that I'm going to attach some level of culpability to LeBron James because you are the leader and your supporting cast that showed up soft and unproductive and with no fight in them. Um, that's a direct reflection on him to some degree, but a larger reflection on Frank Vogel because where was your defensive game plan? Your starting lineup, you had never started them together all season long. Montrell's Harrell, how the hell have you utilized him? You know Anthony Davis is injury prone. I'm not going to disrespect him and call him street clothes, even though it was funny as hell that Charles Barkley said that, but I'm certainly not going to disrespect him like that because I know he's injured and I know he wants it. He wants to be out there, but if you hurt, you hurt, and that's just how it goes. Uh, but I'm just going to look at it from that perspective and say, what about Frank Vogel, your defensive schemes, the personnel that you put in there, who you prepared to be ready in the event that Anthony Davis wouldn't be ready. All of this is a reflection on Coach Frank Vogel. Now, if you don't mind, KP, I'd like to move on from that and let's get back to the Boston Celtics if that's where we're going. Because I got to admit, my whole mood has changed with this kind of nonsense. I'm I'm just in a different place right now. I'm in no well, mood to play around I- with the kind of stuff that I'm seeing going on. No, and I'm with you, but I, that's, that sounds like you letting me off the bed. I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you letting me off this bed. Thank you. Let's move on. All right. Yeah, Perk. Well, Perk per- is down at 84% on his predictions, according to my calculations. <laughs> yeah, 85%, 100% of the time. All right, Perk, let's go there. Stephen A. just teed you up, but to reiterate the news against Danny Ainge stepping down, Brad Stevens, a full-time role in the front office, and he's going to lead the coaching search for the Boston Celtics. You are a former Celtic. What are your thoughts on these moves? Well, well, first of all, this is this this goes back to the treatment of African American coaches, okay? Because once an African American coach get fired, guess what? There's no moving up in the front office front office roles. No, once you're fired, you are fired. And so what they did was they wanted to get rid of Brad Stevens. I had a feeling, and I've been saying this all year long that he is the problem. I felt like he couldn't coach Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, but instead of firing them, they didn't just fire him. They fired, They just said, you know what, he's going to move up into a front office role, keep his job. The same with like a guy with like Lawrence Frank. But when Nate McMillan get fired, no, he gets fired. He had to go in as an assistant under Atlanta Hawks. That's the whole problem I have with the situation. Did I see this coming? No, I did not see Danny Ainge expected uh expecting to step down i did not i talked to danny age a lot he never mentioned it mentioned it to me one time that's the problem i have with this situation i i hear you guys about the racial component and it's the the extent of it is unknowable but probably present it's hard to escape um i would point out that doc rivers who's a great coach and everyone knows he's a great coach didn't do as well as expected with the Clippers. They took his GM role away, but kept him as coach because he was a better coach than GM. And when he lost that job, he immediately got another great job because he's Doc Rivers uh, with the Sixers. And there are other examples. I mentioned years ago, Isaiah Thomas went back for GM coach, both with the Knicks. And Stephen A., you point out, but never someone who just got handed a job like Steve Nash did with the Nets, although, again, that was based on relationships he had with the best players who are African-American. And I suspect, but there's no way to prove it, that were Nash black, he would have still gotten that job, but maybe not. Like, you know, you, you can't say that for sure. I think the Celtics think a lot of Brad Stevens, I think, as a basketball guy, and a little less of him as a coach with this group of guys for now, but wanted to keep him in the organization. And there are other examples Throughout basketball history, I think of Jerry West and Pat Riley, who were co-coaches, and Jerry West said, no, no, he's the coach, and Jerry West went to the front office, that were also kind of weird like this, and that's where my mind goes. Yep. Uh, And I said this earlier, Perk, when you weren't on the show, I think the term to describe it is called failing up. Not sure if you guys feel that it fits here, but it sounds like it. Uh, Perk, thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate you. We'll talk to you soon, sir. (laughs) Snoop had some choice news. Okay, so Danny Ainge stepping down as president of basketball operations. Brad Stevens 
will move into a full-time front office role, and he will lead the coaching search for the Boston Celtics. Stephen A., uh, we had some technical difficulties, lost your shot. I want to get your response here to what Kendrick Perkins had to say, that he didn't see this coming. Well, he didn't see this coming. I didn't see it either. But, it, it, you know, I, per, I particularly don't care uh, as it pertains to Danny Ainge. He's had a long enough career as an executive. And he, if he ends up landing someplace else, I'd applaud it because he deserves it because he has a resume that speaks to that. I wish not throw no shade on Danny Ainge. I do think that he should have went after Anthony Davis a bit harder. But then again, with Anthony Davis uh, per perpetually injured, we understand why he may have been reluctant to do so. As it pertains to this, here's what I want to do. You know, again, when we talk about Steve Nash, we talk about Tim Tebow, we talk about, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, Brad Stevens and stuff like that. I want to call out the NBA players. You got something to say about everything else. Where you at? We got one, uh, you know, you got some people out there that saying Raphael Stone ain't making the final calls, even though Fertitta and the Houston Rockets swear that he is. Okay, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. You got Masai Ujiri in Canada. You got Raphael Stone in Houston after everybody's departed, and he basically has no team. They ain't African Americans that have been toiling through the terrain and trying to become executives in the National Basketball Association. Last time I checked, that's the case. We see coaches on the sideline. They don't want to become head coaches. They've been assistants for years. You got a guy like Phil Handy in Los Angeles that's been an assistant everywhere he's going to get championships. Cleveland, Toronto, and L.A., okay? And it wasn't just LeBron. It was Kawhi, too. There's a plethora of guys. You got Sam Cassell. He's going to be a hell of a coach one day in the NBA if he gets that opportunity. Chauncey Billups. Everybody was talking about he had an opportunity to get uh, an executive's position. And then suddenly it dwindles. But Steve Nash, who we love and respect, great dude, got a black agent, one of the great ones, Mr. Bill Duffy. Big, Steve Nash never coached on any level. And not only does he get the job, he gets the job with the full support of Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, who, by the way, never insisted that a black candidate be interviewed and put forth, put, be put front and center so we'll know who that individual is. We got Brad Stevens here. It's Boston. Tatum's your star. Jalen Brown's your star. We understand what role that they play, particularly Jalen Brown, in social justice issues. We're supposed to be woke. We're supposed to understand that that knee on George Floyd's neck wasn't just about violence and police brutality. It was also the figurative semblance that it provided, where you're feeling like constantly people have their knee on your neck since the time you come out of the womb. We've been talking about all of this stuff, and people are willing to say, oh, Stephen A's bringing up race. Oh, Stephen A's bringing up George Floyd and equating that to Tebow. No, I'm not. What I'm saying is, from a figurative perspective, what we witnessed and what got the nation up and, uh, and you know, it just, just, just inspired was because what we saw was symptomatic and emblematic of how we feel as a people consistently being marginalized, consistently being minimized, consistently being underappreciated, undervalued. And in a world of sports where you got dudes with guaranteed contracts, making money that would secure their generations, generations of family. You got folks hesitant to speak up. You got players, mm -hmm. NBA players, are some of the most powerful people in this world. When have they spoken up for black coaches? When? When have they spoken up for black executives, GMs, president of basketball operations? When has that happened? LeBron, all of them, everybody. Where the hell have they been? Nobody's done anything. And then when we we the media, we bring it up and you got white folks out here going to sit up there and look at Stephen A and say, oh, here he is bringing up race. And none of the black players speak up and say, yo, he got a point. Yo, he's right. Yo, there's something that needs to be done here. Do y'all want me to bring up the Rooney rule and how it might be needed in basketball? Oh, I forgot. I can't do that. Why? Because the Rooney rule ain't even working in the damn NFL. So when are we going to say something about it? I'm just, you know what? I'm going to walk away. I'll be right back because I'm scared I'm going to say something that might get me in trouble because I'm pissed. I'm pissed. Yeah, Perk, you want to respond? I mean, I, 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 I see his point, man. And, and Max, to, to be honest, he, he has a valid point because, you know, you hear, you hear guys, you especially a guy like Kyrie, 
You hear guys, he he always bring up racism. He always talk about this, that, and other. And look, I applaud him because he's active in the community. But at the end of the day, Stephen A. Smith has a point. You have assistant coaches out here, like he named Coach Phil Handy, Coach Sam Cassell, who has been longtime assistants and the same African-American brothers that are in place of power right now would not put their job or would not put their title on the front line. And st I mean, and stand on the front line and speak out for these coaches to get head coaching jobs. But these are the same brothers that will use them in the summertime or use them for player development to get their skill better, but they're not able to help coach them. So I feel his anger. I feel his anger 100 percent. So this is why this is why we are so divided in the world. And this is why you have the conversation and we're having a conversation about Myers and, and Tim Tebow and everybody is mad. But all Myers is doing is looking out for his boy. He's looking out for his boy. He gave his boy Tim Tebow a job. When there's others out there that are well, that are more deserving and have the credentials and have been the, and still in the game or haven't been away from the game like Tim Tebow, but he looked out for his kind. And that's what Stephen A. Smith is saying. I think, I think the elephant in the room is that this happened with the Celtics. That's the elephant in the room. And the Celtics, fair or unfair, because the Celtics were the team to field the first all-black starting five. Right. Like I, I told a story, Melly Mel back you know, I, I'm hanging out with him once, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago. And he had a Celtics jacket on. I was like, what's that about? You're from the Bronx. They started the first black starting five. I've always been a fan since then. So so maybe it's unfair to the Celtics organization and they have this great history. Um, but, you know, even the word Celtic or Celtic. Right. And you're, you're dealing with an area with a big Celtic population. Of, of Irish American, Scottish American, everything else. And that is white, obviously. And in the modern era, you know, after the Bill Russell era, the greatest teams were with Larry Bird and Kevin McHale and Danny Ainge. And they were white stars. Ainge wasn't a star, but he was the shooter and he started. Um, and I, I think that because they have a reputation, fans in the area, again, fair or unfair, Kyrie Irving just recently brought up, I hope there's no subtle racism when I go back. And he stepped on Lucky, their mascot, their logo, right, which is also a, a, a Celtic character. And I think that that, so, so race, the idea that a white coach loses his job and then becomes GM, then what Molly said, there's a sense of failing upward and that there's some racial component to it. I think that's the elephant in the room. Whether or not you agree with it or want to talk about it, I think that's what's on people's, on many people's minds when they hear this news. I can't ignore that it occurs to me. All right, I'll just wrap it up by saying this. I will never understand what it is like to be black and to walk in your shoes, Stephen A. or uh, Kendrick, and I understand your frustration and empathize and sympathize and stand with you because uh, it's got to be completely infuriating to constantly see it and to constantly see the unfairness um, in your face. And, and I respect Stephen A. walking away because that, that's the right thing you can do. Yeah. Uh, but you, you know, you know, what's, you know, what's, you know mm -hmm. what's crazy, Molly, and I appreciate yeah. you. But, you know, you know, what's crazy is that we could come like myself in particular. I'll come on TV. And if I disagree with anything that one of the African, one of the Af my African American brothers are doing in the NBA, just a disagreement, mm -hmm. not about racism or just just to disagree to this point. You know what I get called? I get called the sellout. I get called the coon when I'm just voicing my opinion about basketball takes. But here it, all, here it is. You got actual guys out here who are making hundreds of millions of dollars and got a lot of power to put people into in position to be successful, people that you see and, and shake hands and call on a day-to-day -day basis, and you don't do that. But you rather sit up here and call out a Stephen A. Smith, you rather call out a Jalen Rose, or you rather call out a Kendrick Perkins because we, we don't stick to the point or we doing it because we're cooning. Yeah. The Lakers, uh, one loss shy of becoming the sixth defending champion to lose in the first round under the NBA's current playoff format. It would be LeBron's first time going home in the first round. He entered the playoffs 14-0 in the opening round. Stephen A., you're up first. Who's most accountable for the Lakers' blowout loss? 
Well, I, I, I'm going to put most of the onus on LeBron James and Coach Frank Vogel. I mean, listen, it's a game six. It's not a game seven. Uh, it's not the end. You know, you don't write the epitaph of LeBron James because of this, because there is a game six, rather, because uh, this was game five. There is a game six, um, potentially a game seven. So it's not over. Uh, but you knew what you was what was stacked against you, particularly with Dan Anthony Davis out. And here you are. You show up. And I know that you made passes and guys weren't shooting open shots. I get all of that. Other times they were missing. Uh, and I let Max get into all of that because there were a few people on the Los Angeles Lakers that were pathetic. They were soft. They were weak. They came across as a team uh, that conceded uh, the game uh, pretty much minutes into it. But LeBron's the leader. And guess what? He didn't look much better. So I'm going to put that on him because it's not just about you scoring your points or whatever. It's you galvanizing the troops and leading in the way that you're supposed to. He didn't do that last night. But the big onus... A bigger onus to me falls on Coach Frank Vogel. See, this is it's moments like this where you get reminded that Frank Vogel wasn't their first choice. He really wasn't their second choice. It's just that because of somewhat of a check and pass against Jason Kidd, he couldn't be the guy that was hired to be the head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers. Because I'm here to tell you as a point of fact that Jeannie Buss wanted Jason Kidd to be the head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers, which is why everybody was contemplating, you know, how long is Frank Vogel going to be there? But props to Frank Vogel who came in and won the chip last year and had them ready to play in the bubble. But last night, Mr. Vogel, Coach Vogel, where the hell was your defense? I mean, we saw guys running layup lines. We saw guys shooting uncontested, wide open, three-point shots. We saw them pushing the ball up the floor and guys not getting back. We saw you start put forth a starting five last night that hadn't started together all season long, if I remember correctly. And by the way, where the hell is Montrell's Herald? Where the hell is he? Okay, because it's just inexcusable, inexcusable that you haven't found a way to use this dude who's the sixth man of the year. You brought him there. I understand that Andre Drummond is a bigger body. He can play. He was serviceable with his 13 rebounds for offensive. But Montrell's Herald is an energizer bunny. He's a dog, and I mean that in a positive way. He's a dog. Where the hell is he? You got to put him out there. You know Anthony Davis is not reliable. Now, I'm not going to disrespect Anthony Davis because if you injured, you injured. And he's got multiple injuries to the same leg, Max, and I get that. But damn, you got Charles Barkley on the air. I mean, if ever there was a time Charles Barkley was hilarious and made you fall out of your chair, it was street last clothes. night when he called Anthony Davis street clothes. Yeah, pull up the, the street street clothes. Clothes. we have his street injury clothes. history for this season, I, if we can pull that up. I, 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 I mean, that just, I mean, that was just hilarious, okay? And I ain't knocking, I don't like to chide in Anthony Davis, because you injured, you injured, and I respect that. But the bottom line is, he's an injury-prone player. You know this, Frank Vogel. How in the hell do you not prepare the Los Angeles Lakers, particularly your front line, to be able to play without Anthony Davis, at least defensively, at least when it comes to rebounding, at least when it comes to having some kind of interior presence. That's on Frank Vogel. That's on Frank Vogel. Yeah. So I'm just looking at it, Max, and I'll hand it off to you by saying this. LeBron James, listen, it's on the line. I don't want to hear no damn GOAT conversations. It was yeah. never an issue with me. I don't want to hear, you better show up in game six and be not just a great player we know you to be, somebody who's worthy of being on the Mount Rushmore. You better galvanize these troops and get these boys ready because your teammates look soft. They look weak. Last night, they just got straight pumped. You down All by right. 30 in the first let's, half. Let's get, you let's get Max in here. That's what happened. The person most responsible for the loss, and it took a lot of people mm -hmm. to have a loss like that. Like, you could say whatever you want. I don't know what happened in the second half of that game. Anyone watching the second half of that game? Everyone was watching Denver and Portland. 20 down, 27 down, 30 points teams. at the half. Get out of here. The person most responsible for the loss is Dennis Schroeder. That's the person most responsible. And I don't want to hear, Stephen A., the particulars about what role needs to be filled now that AD's not playing. It's much simpler than that. Your best player is LeBron. He was able to play. Your second best player is AD. He couldn't go. Your third best player is Dennis Schroeder. Dennis Schroeder turned down $84 million because he wants $100 million. 
He's the third best player on the team. He has to step up and be the second best player. The big question was, okay, Schroeder's better than Rondo in the regular season. We're not in the regular season now. We're in the playoffs, and there's playoff Rondo. What's playoff Schroeder look like? There's no such thing as playoff Schroeder, apparently. Stephen A., here are the numbers from Schroeder last night. 0 for 9 shooting. 0 for 4 from 3. He had one assist and no points. He had, when you needed this dude to step up, he had zero points. Not in the first quarter, second, in the game. Zero points. It, the first Laker to go scoreless in a playoff game while shooting nine plus shots since the franchise moved to LA. So you can talk to me about Montrez Harrell and Andre Drummond and how coach should have used them and LeBron not stepping up enough and everything else. Your wannabe $100 million point guard needed to step up and he gave you zero points. He did something that no one has ever done with the Los Angeles Lakers. If you're looking for one guy to blame, Schroeder deserves it most. Please, please, no disrespect, Max. You're not wrong. I'm not trying to imply that you're wrong with what you're saying about Schroeder himself and his pathetic, weak, impotent performance. You're absolutely right. But it's an absolute joke if you acting like he the cause of what the hell happened last night. You could have a bad game like that from Schroeder and still be a bit more respectable. Understand that we're not here talking about how the Lakers lost a game. If we just talk about how they lost game five, we dissect how they lost game five. All right, you roll back to the Staples Center for game six. This conversation is about a beatdown that took place in Phoenix. A straight-up beatdown. They got punked, yo. I mean, these brothers rolled up on the court. Phoenix said, get the hell out of the state. And they did it in, like, inside of 15 minutes. We got Snoop Dogg on Instagram talking about the Clippers. The Clippers. So you have Snoop, Snoop Dogg talking, talking, it, talking Clippers. Clippers. You did something. I, put that. The, the, the Snoop Dogg wears purple and gold. Snoop Dogg got a car draped in purple and gold. Snoop Dogg got. I've been at the compound, Max. I've been at the compound. The Snoop compound. Lakers stuff everywhere. Snoop Dogg was the one going crazy when Kobe dropped 60 on his last night in the NBA. God rest his soul. Snoop Dogg was on Stephen A's world on ESPN Plus. The Clippers. The Clippers? And this brother goes on Instagram and it's like, yo, it's about the Clippers now because the Lakers are soft. He called the Lakers soft. He said they can't guard. He, he talked about Coach Frank Vogel and how he needed to be fired. He brought up Montrell's Herald. I mean, my God, that was a beat down. And they better show up against it. I got that. Molly, I got to fly to, I, I, I was planning on being in New York, looking forward to enjoying my next few weeks. The weather nice, it's beautiful. The weather, you know, they see outside the pier at South Street Seaport. I was planning on being in New York. I got to fly to LA tomorrow. I got to be there. Uh, we all feel very sorry for, for you. Because we feel very be sorry for you. It could Molly, be do you end. feel sorry for Stephen A? It could be the I end. always feel sorry yeah. for him. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying. Our sympathy, It could Stephen be the end. It yeah. could be the end. LeBron James, first time going home. In the first round. All right, let me just career. say this. Let me say this. Yet. LeBron Not James, keep in mind, has the most points per game when facing elimination. More than MJ, more than Will. MJ so it him. ain't over, folks. <laughs> um, let's keep it going, though. All I have to say is 55. Dame time all night long. One of the most incredible postseason performances ever. Lillard, 55 points, an NBA playoff record, 12 three-pointers, and the Trail Blazers double overtime loss at Denver in Game 5 on Tuesday. Lillard broke the record of 11 set by Klay Thompson. That was in 2016, Game 6 against OKC. Dame Dalla. That's lost, man. We, I mean, it's do or die now, so we got to win both of the next two games if we want to, if we want our season to continue. As simple as that. But after what you gave, just personally. Like it don't matter. We lost the game, so I mean, at this point, all that matters is we can't lose another game in this series. So we go out there, we play to win the game, and uh, we came up short. So uh, we going back home. It's a, a must win, or else our season is over. And 
then we got to come back here and, and win on their floor again. So, I mean, that's what it is. How do you not root for that guy? Uh, Dame caused quite a stir on social media last night. Patrick Mahomes, uh, man, Dame Lillard is crazy. Steph Curry chimed in. Dame Lillard, that's all I have to say. Donovan Mitchell, wow. Stephen A., where does Lillard's performance rank? I have no idea. All I can tell you is that it's up there. It's one of the greatest performances I've ever seen in all my life. What a spec. Listen, I've seen Jordan drop 63 at the Garden. I've seen Kobe drop 81. I've seen Devin Booker drop 70. And it's appropriate to bring Devin Booker's name up when he just dropped 30 on the Lakers last night. Okay? I've seen LeBron and Kobe drop 60. I've seen great performances from Dwayne Wade. But this brother, Damian Lillard. Oh, my God. See, I just get sad. I'm sad over three things. I'm sad at his supporting cast. I'm sad at his coach. And I'm sad at the market he's playing in. I'd give anything for Damian Lillard to be in a market like New York City. I mean, my God. This brother, when it comes to clutch time, I mean, and, and then here's the thing. Let me let me just break this down. I'm sad because I watched the brother drop four three, uh, 12 threes. I saw him drop a three at the end of regulation, two threes in the first overtime. I mean, this brother just brings you back, just keeps coming. He's just a sniper extraordinaire, the likes of which we haven't seen this side of Steph Curry, okay? And when you talk about clutch, you bring up Michael Jordan and the rest of the crew because he's right there when it comes to clutch, okay? And then you see this brother take the ball out of his hands and feed Robert Covington for a dunk. Covington, a veteran, not a rookie. He misses it. On another play, he gives the ball to C.J. McCollum. Now, I love C.J. I don't like the fact that he shot 31% last night. Good brother, great shooter, you beautiful backcourt mate, even though I'm on the record stating those two will never win together because the combination of the two, they're both relatively small guards, and I think you need one bigger than smaller, and I think that you use one as a tradable asset to get what you need to put with the other. That's my personal opinion, Max. But you see Jay McCollum, and you a veteran who plays on this basketball court all the time, and you step out of bounds with the game on the line. Yeah, we you have let that your play. Right Can we pull that up, guys? Out the last 12 come seconds on, double man. overtime, what Steven come is talking on. about. Yeah, come on. Come on. You you know, you, you just can't make a mistake like that. I understand no one's flawless. All of us are imperfect, okay? You cannot make that McCollum's, mistake. It's McCollum's usually reliable when you pressure. got... That's right. He is. He is. I'm not trying to throw any shade on him. I'm just talking no, about the you're one not play. Wrong what you're saying. You cannot make but, that mistake. But Look, Max, could you, you argue can't that, do that you wouldn't have seen somebody like an MJ or Kobe do that there and, and give him the ball? Like no, the no, game no, has no, no. taken the shot there. No, 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 no. MJ gave it up. MJ gave it up to Pax. They, they would do it too, Molly. I, yes, I can't Molly. criticize MJ Damian Lillard it. for the mistakes of for Covington missing a dunk or from McCollum, who's normally clutch, stepping out of bounds. That's not Lillard's fault. It's an all-time great performance. To answer the question, it's as good a clutch performance as you want to see. But I want to be very clear about this. The best player in the game was the Joker. Get over it, America. The Joker was the MVP this year, and no one wanted that to be the case. Everyone, we all wanted it to be Damian Lillard, but it was Jokic. In the game last night, the reason Lillard had our jaws on the floor. It was jaw-dropping the way he kept it. They were dead, and he would shoot them back into it. Late in regulation, and then he hits three after three, and then the three to tie the game to send it to overtime. But you know why? Because the Joker was controlling the game. Then overtime starts. The Joker controls the game. He's the point center. He's finding open guys. Of course, he's not shooting it like Lillard. He did wind up with 38, 11, 9, and four blocks. But no, he cannot shoot like Lillard. No, he can't shoot in the clutch like Lillard. But the reason Lillard's clutch heroics were needed was because the Joker was controlling overtime. And then Lillard does it again and gets them to double OT. The Joker was the best there, too. He controlled it there, too. He was, he's the MVP of the league. He was the best player in the game last night. And, of course, he will be overshadowed 
by the heroics of Damian Lillard. Those heroics, which were all-time great. No argument there. Mm -hmm. Remember when I was mm -hmm. telling you, Stephen A., earlier? I well, know we can debate it later. That Steph Curry, except for when it counts most, and Lillard does a fair enough impersonation of Steph normally, that since he's better under pressure, give me Damian Lillard. I'm not taking anything away from Lillard. But the best player in the game last right. night was the Joker, and that's why his team won. Well, first of all, well, first of all, um, I would appreciate it if you wouldn't make it so obvious that you didn't watch the entire game because I know it's the second game is past your bedtime, Max. I know the second game is past your bedtime because evidently you didn't watch the game. As the great as Joker as Jokic was, I'm sorry, I saw Michael Porter drop 26. I saw Monte Morris drop 28, and he was phenomenal in the second half. I understand that it ain't just about scoring. It's about passing, too. And you had Jokic feeding them. I get all of that. But these brothers were making shots. And when you look at the best player on the court last night, Jokic was absolutely phenomenal. I get it. Nurkic should be ashamed of himself because you see somebody like him. You got to put you got to put Enos Cantor on 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 um, on uh, Jokic because you know Nurkic wouldn't be able to do anything with them. No, because Nurkic fouled out at it from. I understand that, but what I'm saying I'm just. What did I say about Nurkic the other day? Is my point. I understand he fouled out. The point that I'm trying to make, he can't deal with the brother. He can't. You know what? You got an offense. Make him work. Cause him some problems. But Nurkic can't do that yeah. when it comes against the Jokic. In the end, Damian Lillard was the best player on the court last night. The difference is Jokic had help, and Damian Lillard did it because there was a whole bunch of dudes shooting in the 30 percentile last night for Portland. They made mistakes too. They didn't show up to help Dame. All right. I got to wrap you up here, Stephen A., because I got some more breaking news here. This again from Woj on the Danny Ainge situation. Oh, Here's the latest. Let me read it to you on Twitter here. He's expected to step down as president of basketball operations for the Boston Celtics. Brad Stevens is expected to assume a more prominent role, a front office role with the team. Stevens moving into the front office on a full-time role and expected to start a search for a new head coach. Sources telling ESPN Celtics staff and coaches have been informed of those changes. Wow. We got all that. We'll react to it in a minute. Let me get in a break. Stay here. Plenty more to come here.